Okay, very good. So, for the, the talk this evening, this, for many of you, as Dennis was saying, would know that this is going to be the last talk for me for a while. So you'll be uh, without all those bad jokes for the next two or three months. You'll be free <laughs> from corny humour as uh, the monks start their little retreat. And today especially is a very holy day in Buddhism. You look up and it's a full moon day today. It's called the Asala Puja. So it's a very, very important day. And it's a time that you know, we monks just go off and um, have a nice quiet time for ourselves, just balancing the work just with the rest, which is important. And for those of you who were there last Sunday at the uh, ceremony to begin the rains, you may have heard me say a request because you know, I do a lot of work for the community and sometimes I do get very tired. And so I was asking people just out of respect and out of kindness to myself and all the other monks, I made the announcement last week, please don't die during our retreat <laughs> because if you do I have to come out of the retreat and do your funeral service for you and that breaks my meditation. So just out of respect and out of kindness, can you please delay your death until at least no October or, or even better November. <laughs> So, of course, there's, a <laughs> there's always karmic consequences when I say silly jokes like that. Because on Monday I got an email and one of my disciples died. They only left it for one day. And so all my plans of what I was supposed to do on Tuesday and Wednesday were thrown into turmoil as I had to go to Singapore for their funeral. So on Tuesday morning at one o'clock in the morning I had to take the flight and I came back on Wednesday afternoon. Just, you know, 20, no, less than 24 hours in Singapore to help with a funeral service, which is a nice, compassionate thing to do. But it also reminded me just of the nature of this life. You cannot control anything. I cannot control my future. The most important thing in life which you can believe in with certainty is uncertainty. Just the fact that this world will always surprise you. And in fact, if sometimes people ask, you know, Ajahn Brahm, what do you believe in? What religion are you? Yeah, you can say you're a Buddhist and you sort of believe in a Buddha, but what does that actually mean? There's just a statue behind you. But in fact, I should mention to you that there's a census coming up next month. So please, whether you do or you don't, please write down you're a Buddhist, because if you don't, and if the numbers of Buddhists go down in Western Australia, I'll, I will lose my productivity bonus. <laughs> So out of kindness, compassion for you, <laughs> put down Buddhists. Otherwise, I might get the sack from the BSW way because, you know, I don't produce. You know, it's always the same in all organisations. You know, want to see your sales, so how much you produced. <laughs> so if the numbers go down, I'll be in big trouble. But, but anyway, you know, if you are a Buddhist, actually, what do you actually believe in? And OK, I mean, there's many things you can't be certain of, but the one thing which you can believe in, and you can even worship, at least you can respect his uncertainty. And that is actually an important part of our life, to actually respect and worship it. Because the problem is, most of us, we reject uncertainty because we're afraid of uncertainty. We make all these plans of what we're going to do next week or even this evening. And you sometimes you have a whole schedule of what you're going to do next week, let alone sort of, you know, the week afterwards or next year. You have your whole life planned out. Ha ha, stupid. Of course you can't plan out your life. You don't know what's going to happen next because life is uncertain. That's one thing which we know is a truth. Yeah, people can believe in God, they can believe in this, but we can't know that for sure. But what we can know is that life is uncertain. It's always like work in progress. It's things evolving. And this evening I wanted to ask you, why is it we cannot accept that? Why can't we worship uncertainty? And why do we want to sort of throw it away and try and force this beautiful, uncertain evolving of our life into some fixed plan to put nature into a box 
And when we put it into a box, this is what nature must do, because I've got a plans for this weekend. This is what it has to do. And when you put nature into a box like that, when you try and control the force of uncertainty, what happens to you? It's always the same, isn't it? You get frustrated, you get angry, you get disappointed. Someone over in, when I was in Singapore, just for the funeral on Tuesday, they were asking me, said, I have a trouble with rage. We're getting angry. Can you please give me some way of dealing with the anger I feel? And this is one way, is to understand that a lot of the anger which you get is when all your plans get thwarted and all of your expectations don't actually uh, come to fruition. When the course of your day or your week gets blocked, when things don't go the way they should. Have you ever got into problems like that? You shouldn't be like that, wife. Husband, you shouldn't say things like that. What do you mean, shouldn't? How long have you been alive? That's what wives are like. That's what husbands are like. It's like telling a dog you shouldn't bark. Like telling a cat you shouldn't curl up in the warmest place of the monastery. We've only got one fire in the sort of our monastery, and that's the cat's place. You know what it's like? Really, it's been really cold the last few days. So you tell a cat you shouldn't be doing that. What do you expect? That's what cats do. So all of this hopes and expectations, so often they're totally unrealistic. You know, the great uh, meaning of today, the full moon day of July, the start of this retreat, was when the Buddha gave his Four Noble Truths, the essence of Buddhism. And the first Noble Truth was the law of suffering. And what actually is actually suffering? And somebody asked me that a long time ago. Again, I think it was, no, I don't know if it was in Malaysia or Singapore. One of these executives who was in a rush. You know what people are like? They're busy. They can't spend all... No, even you spending an hour listening to a talk is amazing. Most people want to get it quickly. I often thought of getting like a drive-in Buddhist temple. You know, just go in there, you order what talk you want, and I give you advice, anger, depression, or whatever, and you go in, you go to the window, and you a few nice wise words, thank you very much, pay your money and leave. I mean, that would be a wonderful thing to have a drive-in Buddhist temple these days. But, uh, <laughs> so this person was doing that, he said, okay, this, this Buddhist teaching, Four Noble Truths, suffering, what is suffering? Come on, quickly. And actually, the, the, you know, sometimes I'd like it when people put me on the spot like that because when you put on the spot, often you rise to the occasion. And I was rose to the occasion. I said, what suffering is asking from the world what it can never give you. And that was actually incredibly profound. And I was actually quite amazed at myself. Where did you get that one from? But no, investigate that. Asking from the world what it can never give you. And how much do you suffer because you continue to ask either from your partner, from your boss at work, you know, from your footy team, <laughs> or even worse, from yourself? Asking from yourself what you will never be able to do. That's called suffering. And why don't you actually put it in a picture like that? You know, it's obvious. Now, at the end of suffering is don't ask from the world what it can't give you. And even like certainty, the world can't give you certainty. It's against the nature of the world. Like the against the nature of dogs, to get a dog which doesn't bark. It's impossible. Actually, probably someone's going to say to me, yes, they've developed a dog which doesn't bark. Every time I say things like this, someone comes up afterwards with an article from some weird magazine to prove me wrong. <laughs> but... You know what I'm talking about. Asking from the world what it can't give you. And certainty is one of those things which the world will never give you. And so when we look at all of our plans, which we have, and our expectations, expectations are part of plans. What we expect of other people, what we expect of ourselves, what we expect of life, even what you expect of this talk now. All those anticipations and expectations it won't turn out the way you want it. 
it will always turn out totally different. You've experienced that, I've experienced that. All of the plans which I've made in the past, most of them have just disappeared. They didn't come true. And I've been a, a, alive long enough and aware for such a long time to realize the problem is not the world, but my expectations. All these shoulds, it should happen this way, it should happen that way. And one thing I realize is this life is so uncertain. The sooner I can accept that, the sooner I won't suffer. The sooner I won't be asking from this life what it will never be able to give me. So instead of trying to reject uncertainty of life, instead of being afraid of it, we embrace it, celebrate it, we worship it. So if anyone asks me what I believe in, I'm a great follower of the great God of uncertainty. <laughs> That's what I worship, uncertainty. I'm an uncertaintyist. <laughs> because when you embrace uncertainty rather than worship it, respect it rather than trying to challenge it, number one, you never get frustrated in life, you never get angry. You don't expect things to be different. I've done this as a test for a good Buddhist. If you really think you're a good Buddhist, you're enlightened, or you know, at least you understand about life, the test is this. You know, that somebody rings you from overseas, and they say that maybe you know, a loved one has just died. Maybe they're only 16 or 17. And you say, yes, I expected that. Can you say that, or are you shocked? What do you mean you expected that? They were perfectly healthy. I expected that because life and death are uncertain things. Or you, you check your, your shares in the stock market and you've lost everything. The company has collapsed. And you say, yes, I expected that. Can you do that? Because if you can, you understand what uncertainty is. Basically, you try your very best, but you don't know how this world is going to turn out, and you accept and embrace uncertainty. But what most people do, as soon as you get that news, you're shocked. Why are you shocked for? Don't you know that young people die? Don't you know that the stock market goes up and goes down? It's always yo-yo. That's the nature of this world. What goes up, what goes down, what goes down, goes up the nature of this world. So a person who understands and embraces uncertainty is never surprised, is never shocked. Because what happens when you get surprised and shocked, you get sort of angry, it debilitates you. And a lot of times you waste so much time getting shocked, getting angry, getting upset, it means you're not being proactive, you're not doing something. And in life, there's always something you can do with whatever you've got. Which means a person who embraces uncertainty rather is afraid of it or tries to, to conquer it and control it, the person who embraces it is a person who learns how to adapt no matter what situation you find yourself in. So instead of arguing about life, it shouldn't have worked this way, it shouldn't have happened that way, why did this happen to me, it's unfair. Look, lady, it's happened. Sir, it's there. Now what are you going to do about it? That's why sometimes as a Buddhist, I'm not a very good counsellor. Because when people come up with their problems, yeah, their husband has run away with their best friend, yeah, their boss has sacked them, yeah, that someone's cheated them out of all their money, yeah, they've got cancer, yeah, they're about to die. Very often, I say, yes. What are you going to do about it? Instead of saying, this is unfair, why did this happen to me? That's just looking at the past, something you can never change. Instead of getting angry, instead of getting upset, or instead of denying, this is not happening, it can't be happening, look, it has happened, it's there. Now, what are we going to do about this? Now, of course, you can see that is positive. It's not just positive for the sake of being cool and being sort of popular. This is supposed to be positive. This is actually being sensible. And you'll find no matter what you experience in life, there is always something you can do with it. 
So you embrace uncertainty. You don't try and reject it or think it hasn't happened. You embrace it. And even with cancer, it is uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen next. Even with death sometimes. Look, sometimes I was just talking with someone. I was in over Singapore. I did some chanting for their mum. The lady asked me to come, even though I was supposed to go to a funeral for somebody else. I said, can you please chant for my mum? She's just come home from hospital. And, you know, I think you know, maybe the last time. Maybe it looks like she's going to die soon. So can I come and chant for her? So I went to chant for this lady, you know, I've known her a long time. And apparently after chanting, she got out of bed and started walking around. <laughs> Another miracle. And that's not a miracle, it's just uncertainty. I got into trouble that way, you know, that it was some years ago. Over here in Perth, a family asked me to, to chant for their, their father or mother. I think it was a father who was dying. So I went to the hospital bed and did some chanting, and they started getting better. And the family got upset at me. <laughs> it's true. They said, look, you know, he's supposed to die. You know, he's supposed to chant, so he died well. Not that he got better. Because, <laughs> you know... They they prepared themselves for the death, you know. It's just they got and everything sorted out, you know, psychologically, emotionally. They were prepared, and I come along. The stupid monk comes along, changes everything around. He starts living again. So that's so. I never know what's going to happen. I've been in many many cases like that. I remember also. You know, sometimes this life surprises me. You just can't predict anything. There was this one lady I went to see once at the ICU at. Um, Charlie Gardner's. She was in the ICU. She you know, was um, one of these cases with a flu, and you know, really, really bad cases. Septic all over, bloated. You know, on her last and you know, a few breaths. Can you please come in and do some chanting? So I did some chanting for this lady. And a couple of weeks, you know, I, she looked to all intents and purposes a goner. You know, the the nurses said, "No, not much chance for this lady." But you know, a bit of chanting, a bit of presence of a good monk, a bit of spiritual uplift, you know, would give her a good death. A couple of weeks later, got a phone call from my husband. Can you come round to the house? And she was perfectly well, total recovery. You know, a few things has really surprised me. Now, don't think it's a miracle worker, and don't start sort of. Uh, uh, starting a church of St. Brahms Church. He cures all, <laughs> all beings. And don't go along saying, hallelujah, another miracle. Please don't do things like that. It's not miracles. It's nothing other than the fact that all these things in life are totally uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen next. And that's one of the reasons why, if, you know, if any doctor says you've only got one or two months to live, you don't know what's going to happen. And how, how many people have you known? I know many people. The doctors have come up to them and said, no, your cancer is terminal, you know, you're not going to survive, you're going to die. And that was about 20 years ago, or 25 years ago. First time I saw that was this, this very famous monk, because, I don't know, his, his photo's in the other hall, hall, Ajahn Tate. He actually came to Perth before I came here once, a long time ago. And he had cancer. Because he was a famous monk, he got the very best care. And the, doc the hospital said, look, there's nothing more we can do for you. Just go back to your monastery. You know, so at least you can die with your friends in, in a monastery rather than a hospital. So off he went into the, the monastery, and it was about 25 years later he died. <laughs> Maybe, you've known cases like that. I've known heaps of cases like that. So sometimes you wonder, what's going on there? Is it a miracle, or is it just the fact that no one can know the future? It is totally uncertain. So when you understand that, and there's heaps of cases, what does that mean for your life? It means that all of your plans can only be tentative. Our mistake is, when we try and predict the future, we make these plans forgetting how uncertain life is. Which means that we do get shocked when life doesn't go according to our plan when the aircraft gets delayed, when people don't turn up, when all of the parts of the jigsaw puzzle of your future don't fit. That is one of the main reasons why people get angry. It's not sort of um, something wrong with them emotionally. It's something wrong with their wisdom. You're not really understanding the nature of this world. 
if you understood the nature of the world and embrace that nature, that truth of uncertainty, then you won't get shocked at what you think is unpleasant news. You say, I expected that. This is life. This is what happens. You will not get angry when your plans get broken because your plans aren't that solid. Yeah, you can make plans, but make them bendable, plastic, malleable, to be able to change at the last moment. Never make them in concrete. Otherwise, you're going to get angry and you're going to suffer. We don't want you to do that. So be someone who can, can almost bend, who can change, can turn on a dime, as they say in the United States. If you see a better way of doing it, you just do it. To be able to change, to be able to, to not have such fixed plans, understanding uncertainty, and be able to react almost immediately to circumstances as they are changed. To be able to anticipate that life is unexpected and being able to change accordingly, no matter what happens. So of course that's what I had to do last Tuesday. Called the last moment, go all the way to Singapore and woke up next morning. I'm in a different country, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be in Perth with all my plans of being on retreat and doing all this sort of stuff. But because that you are amenable to change, because you embrace uncertainty, it means there's no suffering, there's no argument, there's no thinking, oh, why me? I just started a retreat, why does this happen to me? It's unfair. Have you ever think like that, life is unfair? Of course it's not unfair. Life is perfectly fair, it's called the law of karma. Look, you always get what you deserve. <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it, to accept? We always blame other people, but no, no, it's your fault. There's that old story from Open the Door of Your Heart. I haven't told it for a long time. Actually, that's just got a message from the publisher. It's, it's now being published in Polish, Bulgarian, and uh, the Tamil language, Malayan or something. Anyway, three more editions. But anyway, this particular story, you know I used to go and uh, teach in prisons and go and hang out with these... Uh, these uh, prisoners, and never call them criminals. Remember what I said? They're not criminals, they're not murderers, they're not thieves. They are people who have committed crimes. And I've said that before. If you haven't remembered, I'll just reinforce that because I'll be away for two or three months. There's no such thing as a murderer. There's no such thing as a thief. There's no such thing as a liar. There's a person who's murdered, a person who's stolen, a person who's lied. They're not a liar. They're bigger than that. There's more to them than that. And if you start criticizing people, you're a liar, you're a thief, you're an adulterer, you can't say that. That's not rational, that's not reasonable. It's also not helpful. Because they're just focusing on one part of a human being, and it's usually a tiny part of them. They're much bigger than that. So when I went to jail, I never saw any murderers. I saw people who were murdered. But that's a huge difference than a murderer. I saw the person. Now, if you see that, you can be friends with anybody. You can respect anybody. There's no such thing as a terrorist. There's a person who does terrorist things. Maybe for 1% of their life, or a fraction of a percent of their life, they're much more than that. Understanding the bigger picture means you don't see criminals. You see people who've done crimes. If you're angry and upset about someone, if you've en got an enemy, it's because you see what they did wrong. They're a cheat. They're a liar. They're not a cheat. They're not a liar. They're a person who's cheated. They're a person who's lied. Understand that, the bigger picture. A lot of the problems in your life get solved. But anyway, going back to the story, I was in going to uh, the prison, seeing these people who had stolen, seeing these people who had thieved, seeing these people who had murdered and stuff, and one of the old prisoners who came to me, he's a really nice old guy, you know, really, really friendly. He's one of the, you know, these, these old prisoners who'd been in and out of jail most of his life. And he came up to me and he said, I want to tell you something personal. I said, what is it? He said, look, he said, I know the other prisoners would say this, but you know, this is, you know, I'm not lying to you, I respect you. I've seen you a long time and... You know, I respect you as a religious person. I would not lie to you. Other people, yeah, sure, but not you, okay? He said, the crime for which I've been put in jail for, 
I didn't commit. I was innocent. I didn't do that robbery, he said. And he said, look, honestly, I did not do it. I'm not lying. I'm not trying to, to uh, cheat you or anything. I didn't do it. I've been put in jail for something I didn't do. And you know when you hear something like that, I've got this, this idea of justice. This is where I've been brought up. Maybe I've uh, enhanced that by being a monk all these years. If I see something which is wrong, I have to do something about it. You can't just sit there as a religious leader and just allow these things to happen. So, you know, I, would, I put my hand up. I support gay marriage. I think it's unfair that people who are gay can't actually have a marriage ser service to actually to, to acknowledge that they're loved to, to each other, just like a heterosexual. And I stand up for people like that. I get into trouble very often, you know, like with, with bikunis and stuff, and you know, having uh, allowing ladies to become uh, fully ordained nuns. Absolutely equality. It's, it's obvious. So I will stand up for that. And I don't mind doing that. And when I heard that someone's been put in jail for something they didn't do, I can't, I can't let that go by. Especially because, you know, I know, because I've you know, been going to those jails for a long time, I know that they haven't got many resources. They can't help themselves. They do need help from outside to right or wrong. Maybe one phone call a week. And they, they can't actually got no money to pay for lawyers. But I knew lawyers. I know many Buddhists who were lawyers. You know, there's what we call like the one-armed lawyers. You know, the one-armed lawyer? If you ever look for a lawyer, always get one who's only got one arm. Because if they've got two arms, they'd always say to you, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. <laughs> and you can never trust them. <laughs> one-armed lawyers, they always direct. And you can trust them. <laughs> So anyway, I knew a lot of one-armed lawyers I could trust. And... You know, I could raise some funds, I could make some phone calls. So I started thinking, all these, these people I would contact as soon as I got out of this jail to help this guy. He's an innocent man, he's put in jail. OK, you may think that jails are nice and easy places to live. You know, they get all these resources, you know, they can watch TV. You know, I don't know what, but look, no one likes being in jail. If you've ever visited a place, it's not a nice place to be, no matter how comfortable you may think it is. So anyway, I thought, no, I'll try and do something about this. And as I was thinking what I would do, he interrupted me. He said, but Brahm, it's absolutely true, I didn't do that crime for which I've been put in jail for. But, he said, there were so many other robberies where I wasn't caught, I think this is fair. <laughs> and I thought, now that is a wise person. Yeah, sure, he didn't do that particular robbery, but these other ones he got away with. So this is karma. It's the law of karma. He got what he deserved. It may have worked, around, worked out in a sort of, not a linear way. The places he did rob, he wasn't caught, but when he didn't rob, he was caught and put in jail. So that's what life is like, isn't it? The law of karma never works like straight. It always goes in a roundabout way. So it was actually fair. And so he laughed and said, no need to do anything, it's just. And so from that little story, I thought, all the things which happened to you. So it's not fair. Why did I get sort of punished? Why did I get this? How many, how many times do you say it's not fair when you were speeding and you didn't pass the speed camera? Have you ever said it's not fair? <laughs> how many times that you have, you know, just not put the right amounts in your tax returns and haven't got caught. Do you say, it's not fair, I wasn't caught this year? <laughs> okay, of course you don't. But when something happens, you did do it, then you say, oh, it's not fair, why did that happen? I got dumped, I got cheated. No, it is fair. <laughs> it's the balancing of the books. That's what the law of karma is. So, you've got to take this on the chin. You get everything you deserve. Ooh. <laughs> that means you can't complain to anybody. You can't say, why me? Exactly. <laughs> so the kid agrees with me. <laughs> yeah. So I get everything I deserve too. <laughs> So when we understand that, 
yeah, it's uncertain. The life goes around this way, that way. And when it happens, instead of complaining about it, why did it happen to me? Why do I have to deal with this? Deal with it. No why me anymore. No feeling sorry for yourself. Life is uncertain. Adapt, react. Not with negativity, which is totally negative, and you know, negativity is negative, which is totally sort of uh, unhelpful. But do something about it. Learn from it. Grow from it. And that's why for years and years, and I've always told these stories, OK, uh, the story of the truckload of dung, that story is well worth recycling, as dung usually is. And <laughs> truckload of dung is, OK, you go back home, and you find in front of your house or in front of your apartment, someone has dumped a truckload, let's not call it dung, let's call it what it deserves, a truckload of shit. <laughs> Cow shit. Smelly, stinky, right in front of your door. What do you do with the shit of life? <laughs> Number one, most people say, why me? I don't deserve this. Of course you deserve it. But the thing is, you don't know when you ordered it, so you can't remember. <laughs> That's the trouble with karma, it's just a bit sort of devious. Number two, you're stuck with it. No one can take it away. Yeah, you can come up to a monk, a nun, a religious person, some sort of guru or, or wizard, and say, please, can you take it away? Of course, you've all been you know, in the shit in time to time. You try to get people to get rid of it for you, but you can't. It's yours. You're stuck with it. You have to deal with it. <laughs> and so there's two things which people do with the shit of life. The first person puts it in their bag, in their pockets, up their shirt, down their trousers. <laughs> they carry it around with them. Why me? It's unfair, it's terrible, it's not nice. That's called carrying the shit. <laughs> now you find if you carry shit around, you lose a lot of friends. <laughs> of course you do, it's obvious. Look, with the best wood in the world, you may be the most compassionate and kind person. But do you always like to be around these people who are negative and complaining, why me, who are angry, grumpy, grief-stricken? You can be around such people for a while, but after a while it burns you out. They suck you dry. We always like to be around positive, happy people, don't we? Like spending time. Look, if I was really grumpy and mean and nasty, would you come here on a Friday night? <laughs> of course you wouldn't. So we always like being around happy, wise, you know, pleasant people. So if you carry around the shit, you lose a lot of friends. Obviously. But there's the other thing you do with the cow shit of life. And it's obvious you dig it into your garden. So instead of just complaining about it, you make use of it. And this is the beautiful thing that you don't need to complain about anything. Use it. And I've found in life, anything can be used. Some of the people who've been through the worst problems in life, the worst difficulties, become the best people. Because they dig in the shit of their life, in their garden. You know, it takes a long time sometimes when you're really in the middle of this. It, you can't just get rid of it in an instance. It takes weeks, sometimes years. You keep digging in a little bit every day. But it always happens, every time it happens, that moment occurs. You look in front of your door and the whole part of shit is gone. It's vanished. It hasn't gone nowhere. Something's happened in the back garden. You've got this incredible garden there. There's beautiful flowers and so, so fragrant that people walking down the street, they can smell it. They like to visit and see your amazing garden and your fruit trees. The apples in there are just so delicious and sweet, so much so you give them to all your friends, and maybe even your favourite monk and nuns. <laughs> we get a share too. Why do you do that? Because there's so many of them. In other words, your garden, which you grow from the shit of your life, is not just for you. It's for everybody who even comes close to you. 
people who just walk past the front of your house, people who just associated with you because you work with them or you, you just know them just in passing, they too share the flowers and the fruits of your garden from the shit of your life. I love that simile because number one, it shows you what you do. You don't complain, you don't get angry, but also shows you the result. Yeah, it's tough, but that's the one thing we know in life. It does happen. It's uncertainty. This will always happen. But now we can embrace it, accept it, and make use of it, and grow from it, and get this beautiful, beautiful gardens of life. So when I learn how to accept uncertainty, instead of complaining, instead of worrying and getting angry, my plans have been thwarted, I was going to do this on the weekend. No, I can stop and change. And I felt so wonderful about being able to go to Singapore just at a moment's notice and help somebody. And of course, one of the nicest things was, it was only they said, you know, probably you can't come, but it'd be wonderful if you could. And say, okay, I'm coming. And doing something which was totally um, unexpected for them. Surprising. Because that's what life is, just a whole heap of surprises. Apparently the next big event, oh, next big event but one which I'm uh, supposed to be involved in. As Dennis said last week, on August the 7th it's my 60th birthday and it's supposed to be a surprise party. <laughs> <laughs> We've not advertised it, with people knowing it, they're talking about it in Singapore. So, so much for a surprise, but it will be a surprise party because I'm sure it will not work out the way anyone expected it. <laughs> and wouldn't it be terrible if you had a party or a surprise, or if you had a weekend and you knew exactly what's going to happen and it all happens exactly as you wanted it to? Oh, come on, that would be terrible. That's not life. There's nothing interesting. There's nothing which you learn. There's nothing where you can grow if something is just so predictable. That's why if life was predictable, there'd be no point to it. It's because it's uncertain. That's why we can be compassionate and wise. Because we don't know what's going to happen. The wisdom opens up our mind to any possibility. And our compassion, our kindness, allows the world to be uncertain. That great saying of compassion for my own father, the door of my heart is open to you, son. Whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you turn out to be, that's the title of that book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, that's where it's from. It's an expression of unconditional love, okay, to me, his son. Extend that to life. Life, however you turn out, whatever happens this weekend, and the rest of my life. Life, the door of my heart is open to you. Whatever happens. That's called embracing uncertainty. That's called worshipping life, the real life. Not the life which is supposed to happen according to all your ideas, but real life. So you can say that for this weekend. This weekend, whatever happens, I will love you even when it all goes wrong, even when your friend doesn't turn up at the right time, even when, like last Sunday, last Sunday we had this big ceremony at Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine, the start of our range retreat. We'd all been organising this, got all these people coming, and when, uh, actually I got up very early, but when I came out of meditation at 6.30, no electricity, power outage. On the biggest day of our, not, yeah, second biggest day of our year in the monastery. No electricity. It was freezing cold. We wouldn't be able to turn on any heaters. We wouldn't be able to make cups of tea for people. There'd be no lighting. Ah. <laughs> you know, I never thought like that at all. I thought, what a wonderful thing. Let's embrace it. It reminded us of the, the first time, it's 28 years we've been in that monastery, the first time we didn't have any electricity. We just use candles. We just, you know, get a gas stove to heat up the water. 
Isn't it just nice we would just adapt? And a lot of times when you adapt, it becomes much more enjoyable. And when you really learn how to, to adapt to situations by always having to have it this particular way, always planned out to the T, oh look, I hate that. That's one of the things I loved about Buddhism, especially over in Asia. You know, I went to Thailand, the same thing happens in Sri Lanka. I've been to Sri Lanka a lot, I've never been to Burma. You go to a big ceremony in Sri Lanka or in Thailand and it's chaos. Nothing is ordered, nothing goes to time. The Sri Lankans call it Sri Lankan time, the Thais call it Thai time. Why is it in Australia we always do things on schedule? <laughs> no, it's chaos. And I loved it. That's why I hate organized religion. Disorganized religion, that's what I like. <laughs> disorganized, which can adapt. And that's one of the great things. You go to some of these big ceremonies, big occasions, in time loss, like, it works. Yeah, maybe it's not according to plan. Maybe, you know, it's not according to the schedule. Maybe things get cancelled, other things get added on. It's just life, it's reality, it's humanity, it's people, and it works. You know that every year, every year I used to go, to, and I still do, I've been doing this for, for about 25 years now, to this, this St George's Cathedral. They have a Commonwealth, interfa Commonwealth Day interface service. And so I've been going there for many, many years. And, you know, I do my little bit of chanting. Someone else does their chanting. And, you know, it was pretty boring. <laughs> but one day, one year, I forget you know, how many years ago, one year we were doing the same old boring stuff, you know, chanting and the same old stuff every year. And just a few people, you know, the people who had to be there because, you know, their, their, their daughter was singing in the choir. Or, you know, they were told to go there by their teachers because of school groups there. And this one year, right in the middle of the chanting, so the dean, John Shepherd, he's a good friend, he, he's been to give talks here before, he was called away. And I, I realised that something was going on because this was not in the programme. And he came back again and he interrupted us all and got on the microphone and said, we've just been told by the police there's been a bomb threat. Some sort of you know, crazy fundamentalist has said it's wrong and it's evil that you have people who aren't Christians in this cathedral. And the police are taking this bomb threat seriously, so we all have to evacuate. That was the best service I've ever been to. Because <laughs> <laughs> the reason was, you know, the whole plans were thrown into chaos, which meant that now we were being human again. And so we went to sort of some hall, had some tea, you know that's when we started talking to each other. Because we had nothing else to do. So had all these people, you know, because it was an emergency, unscheduled, talking to each other, getting really friendly. And when we came back to finish the service very quickly, because, you know, it was only just a scare, some lunatic ringing up the police. There was no bomb in there at all. It was alive. There was the friendship, there was the moving together. It was interfaith then. That was the one time it was really interfaith. And I mentioned to, to John Shepherd, he said, you should arrange this every year. <laughs> it was the best service we ever had. Now the thing was, because it was unexpected, we dealt with the unexpected nature of the things, and it worked because it was alive. It was human again. So when you have these ceremonies, when they're always to the T, no, this moment you do this, this moment you do that. Look, Dennis is our marriage celebrant. Actually, he was asking for some more marriage celebrants. So if you want to be a marriage celebrant, you know, come and see Dennis. It's a great being a Buddhist marriage celebrant because you're allowed to make mistakes. You don't have to be perfect. You're allowed to be disorganized. Well, reasonably so. Please turn up on time. But you can have these ceremonies where you, you do play it by ear. Look, on one ceremony, I remember this is, again, memorable. We're doing this ceremony, was it at uh, Yanship? I remember that one. I always remember that one because we finished the ceremony, give her all the blessings and everything, and now I present Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I said, Dennis, you've forgotten the rings. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis forgot the exchange of rings. <laughs> that was memorable, that was wonderful, and everybody remembered that. That's why it was beautiful. So I would maybe, maybe you've forgotten it out of denial. <laughs> it's a psychological trauma. 
But that's like a marriage they'd always remember. And they talk about it with fun and joy because it's human. When things go wrong, doesn't it actually add this beauty to life? And you think, wow, I always remember that occasion. Do you remember that time? The, the times when I do the funerals, which I really remember when, when it goes wrong. I remember Jenny's not here. I think she's over north at the moment. Jenny's husband, we took her to the... To the, um, the it's, it's called the Open Air Committal Area in Fremantle Cemetery. That's where you don't go in the chapels. There's this big conveyor belt outside. You put the coffin on top. You stand outside. They press the button. It goes through the, the glass door and then goes again afterwards. A very simple outdoor. So it's actually my fault. I, I put my hand up because I told her, I know a thing or two, you don't have to just order your coffin just you know, off the rack. You could actually make your own coffin. You know, so just do it yourself. Design it. Now that's true. It's got a few sort of um, regulations, but you can make your own. And it's not just to save money, just to make it more personal. So this guy, he liked white water rafting, so they made like a little canoe thing for him with, with a few oars on top. Perfectly allowable, and it was personal, it was him. So when they put it on the coffin, the problem was too heavy. They used thick wood rather than the thin plywood. So that poor conveyor belt was struggling, actually, to take it through <laughs> the glass door. <laughs> so the glass door opened. It was struggling to put it through, and the glass door closed <laughs> right in the middle of the coffin, <laughs> stuck, jammed. <laughs> now, you really must feel for these pure... <laughs> I, never, I never forget the face of the funeral director. It looked like he was going to die. <laughs> Yeah, right. Why? No, it's a funeral director's worst dream, like a nightmare. Things go wrong, like that. And he couldn't open the, the door. No one else could. It was absolutely totally jammed, stuck. So there was the guy halfway in the crematorium, halfway out. <laughs> you know, it was Jenny. You know, she usually sits right in front. She won't mind me telling the story that she actually jumped off up in the coffin and tried to push it through. <laughs> and people said, are you really that serious of trying to get rid of the guy? <laughs> but then someone had said, look, it reminds me, I know this guy, I was, went to school with this guy. Same thing, the first day he got a car, he crashed it. The first day in his coffin, he's crashed that too. <laughs> and they eventually got the door open and sent him away. But you know, that was one of the most memorable funeral services and everybody loved it and they said that was him. He probably did it on purpose, so I don't know why. <laughs> Because it went wrong. <laughs> the uncertainty of life is something which I celebrate. So I don't get angry when things go wrong. You think, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that lovable? I open the door of my heart to the uncertainty of life. I don't know what's going to happen next, but what I can do is to open my heart to it and accept it. Yeah, you make plans, but they're all tentative plans. Three months I'm supposed to be in the monastery. I don't know whether that's going to work or not. There's always somebody goes crazy, something goes wrong. I don't know. But I'm not going to say, no, this is my retreat. You can't do this to me. It's unfair. Of course not. If I did that, I wouldn't deserve any retreat. You say, open the door of my heart to whatever happens. Yeah, there's tentative plans. I want to spend a lot of time by myself, but who knows? It might not work out. I'm always adaptable, no matter what happens. And I ask you to do the same. Because the one thing we can trust in life, the one truth, the one God which certainly exists, is the God of uncertainty. And when we worship that, which means we don't try and control it, we don't try and get rid of it, we don't try and say it doesn't exist, uncertainty does exist. And you don't need to be afraid of it. The problem is we're so afraid of uncertainty, we think if it doesn't work out, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be hopeless. It's not hopeless, it's not terrible. When things go wrong, it's wonderful. Now, if everything went perfect in life, oh, I'd just be so bored, so unexciting. Nothing really stimulates you, there's nothing interesting. When things go wrong, that's life, that's joy. You love that. You get so many happy memories all the times <laughs> when there were mistakes, when things went wrong. So when you understand that, you can embrace uncertainty rather than being afraid of it. When you embrace uncertainty, 
you don't get so upset and angry at life. You know there's going to be delays in the aircraft. There's going to be some ash cloud. There's going to be some strike. Something's going to go wrong. Yeah, you're going to make, try and make an appointment. Yeah, there's going to be some traffic jam. There's going to be rain on the road. You get stuck in the red lights or whatever. Yeah, this is life. You're going to be late. You can't always be on time. You know, the thing is that once you understand uncertainty, you understand that all these promises which we make are all tentative promises as well. Yeah, I mean to try and sort of be at my my surprise birthday party. I'm going to try to be there, but I can't guarantee it. <laughs> so you make these tentative promises. So when it, all promises are tentative, you're never letting anybody down. I really mean to do this. I'm going to try my best, but who knows what's going to happen. And that's why, again, I mentioned this before, and it's great with uncertainty, in politics, please don't give your politicians such a hard time for breaking promises. Right. The only thing I say I blame politicians for is for making such promises in the first place. Look, come on guys and girls in politics in Canberra or in state parliament here in Perth or anywhere in the world. Now you don't know what's going to happen next. You may have some idea of how the economy is going to go tomorrow, but next week, another year, the geopolitics, you know, the wars, the the earthquakes, the tragedies in this world and the successes in this world, no one can understand what's going to happen. You can't predict things. So when we make these promises, yes, this is what we're going to do, yes, this is what we're going to, going to uh, legislate for, you can't do that. Because you can't predict the world. A good politician, a good statesperson, a good leader always has to be able to throw all their plans away at the last moment and make new ones to adapt to the situation as they evolved. That's what I mean, you can't make promises. Uncertainty is the rule of this world. It's one of the deepest truths, the most amazing teachings, and unless we embrace that, we're going to make promises which we can't keep. We make plans which we're going to try and defend even though they're becoming more and more stupid as the world changes against our expectations. Which means that we just make more suffering and more problems in our world. So please don't make too many promises. Make them tentative. Yeah, I'll try to be there. If conditions are right, I will be there. I will do that. But keep those, those riders in there. And encourage your politicians to do the same. Yes, we mean to do this. We're going to try our very best. But look, if situations change, the economy changes, or there's some other crisis, please accept that we intended to do our best, but we always have to adapt. And no plan should be ever be set in concrete. None of your plans should be that fixed. You can't change them for a better purpose. It's uncertain. And remember when things do sort of not turn out the way you want them to. Get real, this is life. And it's beautiful that things change. Because in that sort of changeability of life, that uncertainty, that's where we find life's joy. That's where we find the oomph in life, the joy, the adaptability, the surprise, the variety. And that's which tests us. How adaptable are we? How wise and compassionate are we? Wise enough to understand this is the nature of life and compassionate enough to open the door of our hearts to it, to accept life, make use of it, grow gardens out of shit and have a wonderful time. So, this is supposed to be my last talk for, I don't know, who knows, maybe I will be back next week. <laughs> life is uncertain. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. So, any comments, questions, or complaints? No questions yet, but as soon as we finish off, there will be a whole queue, as you. <laughs> I don't mind, that's life. Yeah, you're good. Excellent.
Uh, okay. Sometimes I say her, sometimes him, sometimes it. So it's just a little bit of marketing because too often <laughs> you say him and he. So it's a good bit of marketing just to sort of suck up to the females. <laughs> just get them to come. Because <laughs> look, that, that it's true. So much of our language has been masculine for such a long time. We're just balancing the books a little bit. You know, we talk about mankind for goodness sake. What about women kind? Or it kind? Or animal kind? So too much of our language has been sort of male, uh, leaning too much to the masculine. So it's nice to say a little bit of her or it or whatever. Yeah, I do that on purpose sometimes. That you usually don't get a complaint. You say, oh, that Buddhist monk, he really understands. <laughs> so anyway, does, does that satisfy you? Okay, very good. Whew. That was a tough one. <laughs> really? <laughs> Provoke the male. Yeah. Yeah, mixing up, yes. When you say about promise, where does that put marriage? Marriage? Excellent. That's a very good question. In a marriage, the word marriage actually comes from a Latin root, meaning to gamble. <laughs> it's true, look it up. <laughs> Great answer. Okay. okay, I'll leave it there. Okay, Eddie at the back. Yeah, sometimes you win. Well done. Sometimes you don't. Remember, if you do it once and it doesn't work out, you can always roll the dice twice. And in the same marriage, you can make it work. Yeah. Yeah, go on. There is a book in the library, library there, by Ajahn Chah, who deals with uncertainty. Yeah. The whole book, I think it's called Everything Rises and Falls Uncertain. And that's like a bite, just to share with you, it's like it helped me so much. It's like a fighter to me, it's beside my bed, you know. Whenever things don't come my way, I think you're new, you know, okay? You know, I just read, I, I read the book again so many times and I underline that, you know. Yeah. I just refer to this thing, there's all the answers there. Okay, you do is doing a, a good sales pitch for Ajahn Chah's book. <laughs> just to all pass, which is available in our library for a special reduced price this evening. Very good. <laughs> yeah, okay, another thing, okay, Eddie. Yes. Where, um, even the worst scenario, okay? Yeah, worst scenario. Yeah. Okay, you're saying that it's the nature of this world that when you get into a bad situation, uh, you say it's always going to get better. No, it doesn't always get better. It won't stay the same. Sometimes it gets worse. <laughs> but it will never stay the same. Eventually it gets better again, you know that. It's our mind amplifies it. And that's with the negativity when we, we sort of think, oh, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse. Of course it gets worse because you make it get worse. So just allow it to be changeable. And uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen next. So that's where you open the door of your heart to change. Which is beautiful. I know we like stability, we like predictability, but I think that's because we're not sort of alive enough. We're dead. So life does actually take a bit of sort of uh, courage. Yes. Yeah. Where? I'm <laughs> <laughs> <By> being naughty. <laughs> so she... The lady was saying that when she was in Thailand, she had a large tattoo made, and I asked where she did on her back. She said, it's a big mistake. Should I embrace it? Yeah, why not? <laughs> but, 
Oh, come on, it's, it's great. Sometimes, that okay, it challenges our ego, what we think we want. No, I just enjoy it. If it's a really stupid tattoo, it makes people laugh and making people happy. <laughs> Yeah. Infinite. Okay. Yes, that's very profound because I don't even understand that. <laughs> so see, already your tattoo has made, I don't know, three or four hundred people laugh today. <laughs> and this goes on the internet. Maybe before we actually close, you can actually tell me here and show on the internet your tattoo. <laughs> What a wonderful thing that was. You've given a gift to many, many hundreds of people by making them laugh. No, just enjoy it, whatever happens. So when I make mistakes, I usually tell people about it. It can make people happy. And it's great not having to be perfect. That was just a huge relief for me when I realized I don't have to be perfect anymore. I can be stupid, make mistakes, tell silly jokes, tell them the wrong way, whatever you do. And that was just so wonderful, a relief to know I can make mistakes. So you say, that's my mistake, and I'm so happy, so proud that I can let people see my mistakes. I don't have to be perfect anymore. It's a great sense of freedom then. Then you actually find you are perfect. Yes? Okay, that's very good. The Navajo Indians weave imperfections into their rug because that's where they think the spirits come in and go out. It's the same with, um, with the, the Australian government weaves imperfections into their process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, give them a break. That was perfect. So, yeah, there's yeah, it's the so-called imperfections. I mean, this is life. This is reality. I often say, look... We live up in the hills in Serpentine, but you know, on the edge of the hills we can see the, the sunsets. The most beautiful sunsets are when there's clouds on the horizon. Or even a bit of ash or, or smoke from bushfires. You get beautiful uh, sunsets then. You do need a bit of imperfection to get the beautiful sunsets. It was a perfectly sunny, clear day. The sunsets, pretty boring. A bit of imperfection spreads these incredible crimsons and golds, like fire on the horizons, beautiful. So just like life, when a few things go wrong, that creates a beauty, the oomph, the joy, the, the depth of life. So when you do make mistakes, congratulations. You've just added to a beautiful sunset. It's true, the imperfections of the Navajo rugs, that's where the spirit of life, real life, compassion, love, that's where it comes in. But I don't agree with them. It doesn't go out. It stays. Okay, so that's enough for this evening. I know you're trying to keep me here as long as possible because this is my last talk, but <laughs> I won't let you get away with that trick. <laughs> <laughs>